Okay, um, and this is about the books that I have been reading lately. Um, I'm a voracious reader. I guess that's the most important thing to know about me in terms of reading. I will read anything. Uh, and I am, um, I go so far as to always have a book with me. For example, in my motorcycle, I've always got an unfinished book in one of the saddlebags. In case I get stopped somewhere, you know, run out of gas or something like that, in case I want to stop for a meal by myself, I've got a book there. Um, if I have nothing else, I'll read the back of a cereal box or I'll read the signs at a restaurant or the menu. Somehow, if I'm by myself, I love to read. I think it's because as a child growing up, um, I had a lot of meals by myself. And I learned very early that reading was, having a book there was a great companion. So I still enjoy it today. And I have a, a fairly wide range of reading interests. So I think on that, on that initial list, um, one of the books, for example, was a book called Love's Body by Norman Brown. Um, Norman Brown um, is a psychoanalyst and a professor uh, at Wesleyan uh, for many years where I went uh, for graduate school. And Love's Body is um, his sort of take on uh, Sigmund Freud as applied to literature. And it's fascinating. It's one of the most, uh, there's a word for it. It's, it's very aphoristic, um, meaning that um, uh, you could take a million bumper stickers out of uh, Norman O. Brown's uh, discussion of Love's Body. Uh, there are things that, um, that he says that are just very quotable. Um, uh, for example, um, I think at one point he, he uh, uh, discusses the fact that all language is metaphorical, uh, that it all means something else other than simply what the, the dictionary definition of the word may be that's being used. And I find that a very, a very sort of provocative idea, always have. So Love's Body is a book that I've read probably 10 times in my life. I've had it around for the last 30 years. Not a new book, clearly. Um, the book I've had longer than that that's on uh, the list that I, that I gave to uh, folks at the library is um, Wind in the Willows. Uh, Wind in the Willows is um, it's a classic, obviously. If, if anybody out there has not read Wind in the Willows, go out immediately, purchase a copy, and read it. Um, I had a, a, a wonderful experience uh, as a child. I grew up with a copy of Wind in the Willows. It was published, I think, in 1913. 19, right around the early part of the, of the 20th century, uh, written by a man named Kenneth Graham. And if you don't know it at all, it's, it's uh, uh, a tale of um, some animals, a rat, a mole, a toad. None of them sound very attractive, but they in fact are. Uh, and they live by a riverbank in England. Um, it's a very English uh, sort of setting. And it's about their adventures. But these are very articulate animals, and these are very um, clearly stand-ins for, for um, humans in the way that they have very human uh, sort of interests and human longings and human fears and so forth. Uh, at one point, the mole, who is a newcomer to the riverbank uh, during the winter, goes off on, a, on an adventure and gets lost in the wild wood and feels very threatened by all the odd creatures around. And uh, then his pal, um, Mr. Rat, finds him and they together find the badger and they have a safe haven. It's just as though two children were lost in a snowstorm and came to a safe haven somehow. Um, it, it's a lovely story, but the thing I like about it most is the way in which it's, it's so beautifully expressed by Graham in ways that work for children but also continue to work for adults. Um, that to me is, is um, what makes really a classic piece that anybody picking it up from any background, um, any, any level of education and so forth, um, if you can handle the, the uh, admittedly by today's standards, perhaps a little, perhaps a little bit difficult vocabulary, you can, you can get a tremendous amount of, of value out of that book. Um, another one was, was I believe, uh, that I put on the list, uh, Geography of the Imagination. And this is essays. I love reading essays. Uh, perhaps because they're short, you can sort of read an essay and digest it. Um, during, during the period of time you're spending with a meal. Um, there's some 40 essays in this by a man named Davenport. Um, he's a wonderful writer, very, very articulate. So I'm still working my way through those, the essays in Geography of the Imagination. Um, he takes on, on almost any topic, um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to read. Um, 
I guess I, I think back too about other um, other things I've read. One of the uh, um, things I do is read plays quite a bit. I've always read plays. I've always enjoyed them. Uh, I think because uh, they put the emphasis on visualizing what's there. Obviously, plays are not meant to be read. They're meant to be heard and seen. So when you're reading a play, it puts a particular burden on you, the reader, to use your visual and your auditory imagination to imagine what this would look like played out on the stage, played out on, on some kind of a background. Um, and obviously, given my, my career choice, I love theater. I love anything to do with theater. Um, and I love scripts, uh, which is the first stage in, in uh, doing a production, finding a script that really works. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I have a tremendous fondness for Shakespeare, for all of Shakespeare's work. And again, I guess like, like uh, Kenneth Graham's Wind in the Willows, uh, Shakespeare was able to create in such a way that his material, whatever the play may be, uh, still has some relevance for people today. 400 years after Shakespeare, we're still watching uh, and, and getting caught up in productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream or The Tempest, which I believe we'll be doing later this year. Uh, or of, of um, some of the history plays or some of the tragedies. Um, he still has something to say to us today, albeit in a way that, that may seem a little odd by today's standards of vocabulary and syntax. Um, what else can I say about the reading? I'm, I'm uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm never without a book. Um, I always have something that, that uh, I can direct my attention to. And, uh, my one overriding concern, I think, is that in today's culture, at least in this country, with the emphasis on social media, on Facebook, on, on um, uh, Twitter, um, that we may lose the ability, and in fact, I think as a culture, we are gradually, sadly, losing our ability uh, to appreciate somebody else's articulate expression of thought and feeling um, an attitude and opinion, um, and we're, we're giving ourselves over to these very short, um, almost, almost stereotypical statements um, that don't, to me, seem to have a great deal of value. I mean, I think, I think Twitter, for example, is a perfectly named media. Uh, it reminds me of, of the sound of Twittering, which really has no content, no particular substance. Um, it's just noise. Uh, I admit you know, I know full well. It's a very biased point of view. Uh, I don't attempt to, to uh, defend it by saying this is, you know, the truth. It's just how I feel. Um, if I never tweet in my life, I will be happy. Um, I also, I had a, uh, I created a Facebook page for myself, um, oh, four or five years ago, uh, for the purposes of, of getting in touch with some alums, and that worked fine. I did get in touch with them. Uh, I don't think I've been back to Facebook in probably two or three years to look at that page. Um, I, did, I did it for a particular purpose. But again, I'm, I'm kind of not a social media person. I prefer something that's a little bit more thoughtful and takes a little bit more time to get fully engaged in it. But that's what makes a horse race, different, you know, different opinions, different, different ideas, and so forth. Um, I, don't, I don't by any means say that everybody should feel the same way about reading that I do. Um, I know that mine is, a, is, in its own way, a particularly extreme position. But I love it. I love reading. Um, I can't imagine ever, ever, ever being without it. Um, I mean, if I, God forbid, were struck blind, I would be the first person you know, in the room to want to learn Braille. Uh, that would be my first thing, uh, because without reading, I'm lost. <laughs>